everyone. Uh, welcome to this webinar. Uh, I am Jeha Kim. I'm currently a professor at Seoul National University. I'm also a CEO and founder of Scientific Analog, which sponsors this webinar. Uh, this webinar is titled UCI5 Modeling and Simulation with XMOP. So let's get started. So if you're attending this webinar, I'm sure that you heard about chiplets. So chiplets are fastly emerging as a new way of building IC systems. So uh, instead of integrating everything onto the same die, you build a multiple dies, which are called chiplets, and then you put them together in a package or maybe in a, in a poser to build the complete system. Uh, so this way you can enable what's called heterogeneous integration. It allows uh, the different parts of your system to be built from uh, in different technology, by different fabs, maybe designed by different vendors or companies. Um, and in the basic motivation behind this chiplet is cost. Um, today, uh, the typical IC have become too complex uh, because the Moore's law has been scaling for nearly more than 60 years already. So, the cost of designing any complex chips is so high. And also the risk of any making any mistakes in designing that chips is so high. Uh, that also means if you make any mistakes, the penalty of screwing things up is also so high. So to mitigate that cost and risk, uh, we like to build our IC systems in, in pieces uh, called chiplets and making sure that each of the chiplets work fine uh, once you once you know they work good, then you now integrate them into a single package or substrate. You know that's chiplets, okay. Um, and one of the requirement of the chiplets is that it should have a standardized interface, so that uh, different chiplets from different vendors, different boundaries can talk to each other seamlessly. So the UCIE, uh, which is the acronym for Universal Chip Interconnect Express is one of those open industry standards that try to define interconnects between the chiplets, okay? And today we'll talk about how to model them and how to simulate that uh, models in system barrel. Uh, to give you a bird's eye overview on what UCI is, uh, in its spec, uh, UCIE defines this interface in multiple layers, just like, uh, you know, just like, uh, you know, uh, you know, most of the interface standards. Uh, for example, there are a set of documents describing the physical layer. There's also a die-to-die -die layer, protocol layer, and so on. And in today's webinar, we'll focus on the physical layer, which defines a set of specs for doing electrical signaling. You know, how the data is transmitted from one UCI interface to another, uh, how do you define the voltage? How do you define the current? How do you do the clocking to tell the difference between different bits? Uh, how do you how do you do how to perform training on various parameters in your interface? Okay. And the UCI defines two package types: standard and advanced. Um, and there are some subtle differences between the two, uh, which really stems from the the type of the package uh, that you are thinking of. You, you know, for example, you could be thinking of uh, more of a 2.5 integration on the interposer, or you can be thinking of, of uh, the 3D integration, for example, using a TSV or more advanced uh, interconnect structures like the EMIB and so on. Um, and there are, as I said, there are some differences such as number of data lanes, maximum data rates, whether you terminate the channels, uh, whether you have to support redundancy and repair mechanism, uh, but those are relatively small differences. So in today's webinar, we're not going to worry about worry too much about uh, the difference between these two package types. The UCI interface uh, can be constructed in units of so-called cluster or module, uh, it, which each of which defines uh, the set of signals uh, that two UCI interface will use to talk to each other. Um, and if you need a higher bandwidth between two, two, two chiplets, you'll just simply replicate these clusters multiple times. And each cluster contains uh, a set of data lanes, uh, which is essentially a set of single-ended 
unidirectional full duplex data links. So we'll talk more about that. And to facilitate the communication through the data lanes, you also have some additional lanes like uh, the lane for valid signal, uh, the lanes for forwarding differential clocks, forwarding tracking signal in case the 40 clock doesn't work, and also a set of sideband signals to, to communicate some of the auxiliary information, uh, for example, uh, for, for uh, doing the training. Okay. And this is the key picture of today's webinar. Um, so the UCIE physical layer is made of two sublayers. One is called the electrical layer, and the other is called the logical layer. Basically, electrical layer is the analog circuits performing high-speed data transmission through a actual channel. Uh, this could be, as I said, the interconnect in the interposer, or maybe a through silicon vias or more advanced interconnect. And uh, you see you see parts like FIFO, serializer, and the driver, which take the data and, and transmit the data through the channel. And on the other side, you see uh, the receiver, deserializer, and FIFO. They try to recover those data and feed those uh, into the core part of the shipment. And to trigger uh, these circuits with the, with the correct timing, you have a set of clocking circuits such as the PLL, DLL, and so on. And um, this electrical, the, the different parts of the electrical layer will have a various parameter. For example, uh, you can operate this electrical layer at different data rates. You may have to, uh, you, can, you can transmit data and clock at different phases. You can adjust the reference voltage that you, tell, that you use to tell the difference between ones and zeros. Uh, and you can also uh, uh, calibrate the skew uh, between different data lengths. So all those parameters are calibrated and controlled by this logical layer, which is a giant set of digital finite state machines. So later you'll see that you, there are, it contains a various finite state machine for doing the link speed adjustment, calibration of the clock phase, adjustment on the reference voltage, and the receiver DSQ calibration. And what this says is that the UCIE physical layer is really a big collection of analog circuits and digital circuits that talk to each other in a seamless way. And of course, this is a big challenge whenever you have to design this because uh, this is big, but first of all, and when you have this tight interaction between digital and analog, you cannot rely on one simulator. You, know, you cannot rely on entirely on Verilog, you cannot rely on uh, SPICE, you need uh, some uh, a better simulation platform that can handle both digital and analog. That's where X model comes in. Um, so I'll give you an idea. So one interesting thing about UCIE is that uh, it doesn't fix doesn't specify a one data rate. Uh, you actually have to support multiple data rates. Uh, and, and the way it works is that. Oh, maybe your, your chiplet interface has a maximum data rate you can support, typically either 24 or 32 giga transfer per second. Um, but when something bad happens, maybe the you know, channel is poor, maybe your chiplet is in, the, in a bad mood, then if, if, if the communication fails at, at, at the maximum data rate, the logical layer can decide to operate at a lower data rate. And it's a mandatory to support all the all the, uh, the the data rates lower than the maximum that you choose. For example, if your chiplet interface uh, is supposed to operate at 24 gigabit giga transfer per second, that same interface also has to support 16, 12, 8, and 4. And during the training, uh, the logical layer will decide which is the right data rate to operate at. So it means your electrical layer has to support all these data rate and the logical layer uh, will be able, should be able to, uh, to find the right data. Rate. You know, this is one of the uh, example of the tight interaction between the electrical layer and the logical layer I talked about. On the other hand, sideband uh, has to operate at a fixed data rate of 800 megahertz. That's another interesting aspect. 
So today's webinar, my main objective is to use this UCI Phi as an example to show that X model is really the ideal solution for modeling and simulating this complex analog plus digital systems. And you can do that all in system Verilog using the X model plugin. To do that, I think it's natural to give you a brief introduction to what X model is. And then I will dive into the, uh, the different parts of the UCIE, starting with the UCIE electrical link. And there we'll uh, look at the main band and side band transceiver and how we can model them uh, and, and run a few simulations. And there, since those circuits are mainly analog, we'll find that most of our simulations are measuring like DC characteristics, like DC transfer function, AC transfer function. Sometimes we'll be uh, doing a noise analysis to measure the beat error rate and so on. After that, we'll move on to uh, the logical layer of the UCIE, which would be mostly uh, you know, RTL models. So there is proof, it is described in pure Verilog, uh, and, 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 and all of them will be a finite state machine. In, in fact, it will be a hierarchical structure of finite state machine doing various calibration that I just mentioned. And there are the key challenges is how do we make sure that uh, this finite state machines are all correct? Uh, and this requires some uh, set of skills to do a thorough verification, doing various coverage or assertion checks that many digital verification engineers are currently doing today. So that's the outline. And before I begin the core content, I'd like to give you uh, some disclaimer statement that um, Although I'm talking about UCIE today, I don't represent the UCIE organization and I should not claim myself to be an expert in UCI. Uh, you know, I do have a background in a high-speed IO uh, circuit design and I do have a background uh, in, in running simulation and doing various analog models, but I'm not, I'm not I'm not fully aware of all the details of the UCIE. So if you ask me questions about some details of, uh, of UCIE spec, I might say, I don't know. Okay. And not only that, uh, some of my understanding on UCIE spec may not be accurate um, or fully up to date. I'll, I'll appreciate it. If I say anything wrong, just point me out, okay? Um, and uh, maybe a good news is that we'll be providing all of the models that I'm, I'm showing today, uh, you know, at, at, at free cost, but uh, with, with some uh, word of caution that, that it is provided in a, on an as-is basis that we don't guarantee it is complete or correct, or you can, and you can, you know, use it in a product uh, directly. Uh, so, you know, the model that we're showing today, in fact, went through multiple revisions because we found some errors, we found some misinterpretations, and, and I'm guessing there might be more. So uh, we're, we're basically using UCIE as, an, as, a, as a vehicle to demonstrate X model here. Okay. So let me start with X model. So X model is a plugin extension that works with the existing system Verilog, such as uh, Synopsys VCS, Cadence Excelium, to enable a fast and accurate analog mixed signal simulation. So the idea is system Verilog is a very powerful digital simulator and within the same platform, you can also run analog simulation. So now you can see why X model can be used for simulating uh, the systems like UCIE. Uh, it has a very unique event-driven algorithm that allows much faster speed than uh, another way of doing uh, analog and system Verilog, which is called real number model. And when it models analog circuit, it can describe the analog circuit as a functional model, as well as a circuit level model. And the bottom line is that even after you model analog circuit, which doesn't seem to fit into system Verilog world, with X model, you can run everything in system Verilog and every design or verification flow uh, based on system Verilog will continue to work, you know, such as the UVM, which stands for Universal Verification Methodology. So the key uh, benefit of using X model, of course, is the speed. Um, it has a event-driven algorithm that can simulate analog waveform in an event-driven fashion. 
So for digital, we all know what event-driven uh, simulation is. You know, you only do the computation when there is a change, uh, and the change is defined as one to zero, or something, some signal changing from zero to one or one to zero. Um, for analog, so here the waveform, uh, we have a digital signal going through a uh, analog channel, producing analog signal. Uh, but what what you see on the waveform, these markers on the waveform, uh, they indicate where the events are being triggered. And at least for now, what you see is that, oh, there are only a few events on the analog waveform, and those get triggered only where there is a corresponding input events, uh, corresponding events at the end. And you should be asking, how is that possible? How are we defining events, basically the change of the analog signals? Uh, I should start by explaining how we express analog signals. In most of the analog simulator, like SPICE, real number model, you know, MATLAB, they, when they express analog waveform, they use a set of points. Okay? Uh, and, and the basic problem there is uh, you, it, it will lead to a fundamental trade-off between the speed and accuracy because uh, to, to express an accurate waveform, you need a lot of points, but to get a lot of points, you have to do a lot of computation, which slows down the speed. In X model, we use a very different approach where you use a set of equation. So you, this analog waveform is split into some time intervals, and each interval is described by an equation uh, which has this particular form. And now, each point, when you change your function expression to one to another, is defined as our event. Okay. Why are we doing this? Uh, one reason is uh, it actually allows that efficient uh, event-driven algorithm. So this equation form that I just mentioned uh, can be converted into a Laplace form. And once you signal it has a Laplace domain e expression, you can simply calculate the output response given the Laplace domain transfer function of your cir circuits or systems. That is, you can simply take the algebraic multiplication between the two and get the expression for the output. And what's even though you don't fully understand these Laplace domain computation here, the key point here is that this computation is done only once there, when there is an event at the input signal. That is, when the expression for the input changes, you do this computation once, update the output expression, and that is done. And this is how we perform analog event-driven simulation in system variable. Um, X model is also unique in the sense that it can fully support circuit level simulation, meaning you can describe your analog circuits as a set of transistors, registers, capacitors, and so on. And this whole model will still run in the same event-driven algorithm uh, as I described before. So here is a model, uh, the system variable model describing the circuits on the left, which is literally just putting down each of the element that you see on the screen one by one. Uh, so it's kind of like a spice netlist, just that we're using system variable syntax. And writing models, uh, with an X model is not writing code. So what we did is uh, we built a set of building blocks we call X model primitives. And modeling analog circuits is, is just putting together this primitive to describe what you want. So unlike real number model, you don't have to be an expert in system variable, uh, especially in those uh, uh, user-defined nets or user-defined resolution function which are the extension to, dis to describe some of the analog phenomena. So let me walk you through some of the X model primitives, uh, which might be relevant when, when you try to understand how we model different various parts of the UCIE. For example, uh, we have a seven different categories. One of them is called domain translator. These, these are the primitives that can translate between a clock and its properties, such as frequency, phase, duty cycle, and so on. And these primitives are useful when modeling various timing circuits, like the phase lock loop and delay lock loops. The next uh, category of X model primitives is called stimulus generators. Uh, and these are useful when you uh, compose test benches. 
because they generate either analog stimuli or digital stimuli. Uh, sometimes it can replay waveforms uh, from the previous simulation. We also have primitives for describing digital circuits like uh, logic gates and flip-flops, uh, but these are not meant to describe standard digital logic because for that you just use Verilog. Uh, these uh, are useful when you describe timing sensitive, uh, timing sensitive digital circuits. For example, phase detectors in a phase lock loop where uh, the circuit looks like digital, but you're, you're really processing timing information embedded in the clock signals. Uh, and you don't want to, uh, well, you really want to see a quantization effects due to the finite time step of Verilog. Uh, since we're dealing with the mixed signal simulation, essentially, like having both analog signals and digital signals, sometimes you have to uh, do the conversion from one to another. So we have a set of connect primitives uh, doing those uh, conversion as well as type coercion. And um, when you run simulation system Verilog, sometimes you like to do some automatic measurement uh, so that you can write some assertion checks within the simulation. Uh, so we have a lot of uh, measurement primitives. And as I said, X model can support circuit level simulation. To do that, you have a lot of elements describing the circuit elements, uh, including transmission lines. Also, uh, the, the last but not the least, you have a set of primitives for describing the functionality of the analog circuits, such as adding, multiplying, nonlinear functions, filtering, integrating, uh, converting between digital and analog, sampling, delaying, and buffering, and so on, okay? So again, we have a lot of primitives, and you can describe any analog circuit just by putting together these primitives. And because of that, uh, some people will prefer to do this in a schematic form, for example, using Cadence Virtual Sawyer Environment. So all these primitives that I just uh, briefly described are, are now provided as symbols <clears throat> in this uh, schematic environment. And you can place these primitive symbols on the schematic, connect them up to describe a model. So this is not only easy to compose in some, in, in, to, in some, some cases, it's also easy for us to describe what the model does. So we'll be using this environment uh, mostly to describe our analog model. So here's a snapshot on how the, uh, this Glista environment works uh, for X model. So here, what you see is the Cadence Virtuals environment. These little blocks are the X model primitive symbols. So you place them on the schematic and connect them up. Basically, you build a schematic using these uh, primitive components. Once that is done, uh, you can netlist system Verilog codes out of the schematic and run the simulation within the virtual environment if you like. Uh, of course, you can take the system Verilog uh, code and run the simulation on the command line uh, as well. OK, so as I said, we'll be providing all the models uh, after this webinar. And if you try this out yourself, uh, here's the procedure on, on decompressing the package file and uh, starting the virtual session to browse the model or maybe running some of the simulation on your own. Okay. And of course, it does require X model. And if you're already a user of X model, I strongly suggest you update to the latest release uh, because we have to fix a few bugs uh, to make this model work. 